feel this rage in America. You're just asking to have this happen again. The best strategy is going to be yeah. to convince the jury that David Koresh was misunderstood. We need to humanize him, make him seem less like the boogeyman and more relatable. David Koresh was an opportunistic, narcissistic piece of shit. We're not in the business of defending Koresh. He's dead. <laughs> well, if that's how you feel, then why'd you even take this case? The issue can't be whether or not Koresh was the messiah. If that's our case, then they win. Because guess what? He wasn't.
feel this rage in America. That's me in the corner. That's me in the spotlight. Losing my religion. You're just asking to have this happen again. Hello and welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm Tom Jackman, a criminal justice reporter here at The Post. I typically don't have to look down to see what my name is. Uh, April 19th, a week from today, is the 30th anniversary of the horrific end to the siege of a religious sect outside Waco, Texas, in which 80 people died. And this came after four ATF agents were slain along with six other members of the sect at the beginning of the siege, 51 days earlier. Our guest today first explored these events in the 2018 miniseries Waco. Next week, they will premiere Waco, The Aftermath, on Showtime, which culminates two years later in Oklahoma City. I hope that wasn't a spoiler. Uh, Joining me now are actor Giovanni Ribisi and the showrunners, John Eric Dowdle and Drew Dowdle. Giovanni, John Eric, and Drew, Welcome to Washington Post Live. Thank you. Hi. Thanks so much. Good to be here. Hey. John, Eric, Waco is such a heavy word. So many people have deep feelings about what went on there. What were your preconceptions going into the original Waco? You know, we're talking, so the series aired in 2018, but I think you started working on it three or four years before that. So what were your preconceptions going in and how did that change over these years of writing, re- reporting, producing, filming 11 episodes about this m- moment in American history? Yeah, for me, you know, I, I was sort of, I'd absorbed the, the kind of national narrative that had been, you know, given after the, after the original event. And then, you know, Drew and I were researching something and I stumbled across uh, Waco survivor David Thibodeau's book. Uh, a place called Waco. That was about seven, eight years ago now. And I read, you know, I got about 10 pages into the book and I was like, Drew, we like, we should do like, this is, this is crazy. Like when you actually learn, you know, the names and faces of the people, you know, inside the compound, like when you, when you start to humanize those events, it just changed it. You know, it brought it from a, from a, you know, historical moment to a, to a human emotional moment. And, um, and yeah, it's, I, I see all of it differently. I see both sides of it differently. I, you know, I see the, the humanity and the, you know, FBI agents who were scared and didn't know what to do. And I see the, the, um, humanity and, you know, precious followers and, you know, a bunch of people trying to belong to something and trying to do what they thought was right in the moment. Drew, uh, the two of you said at the launch of the series in 2018 that you were intending to portray both sides, sort of what John Eric was just saying, uh, the feds and the Davidians with a no bad guys approach. You know, it was sort of a journalistic attempt to remain non-judgmental, uh, but you were criticized for portraying David Koresh sympathetically, a man who repeatedly molested children as young as 10 years old. And I think you may get that criticism again in the aftermath. Have you been too sympathetic to David Koresh? I mean, I think that's a a fair question. Um, You know, one thing we did portray at both uh, the original Waco and in the aftermath, we did uh, portray the predatory side of David Koresh. And I don't think it's something that we shied away from. But one decision we made early on was to say, okay, you know, if they wanted to arrest David Koresh, that was, you know, absolutely a valid, you know, objective. But, um, what about everyone else in there? Like what, what had they done wrong and what did, you know, what kind of justice did they deserve? Um, and we thought, you know, what's an interesting way to approach this story is kind of through the eyes of David Thibodeau and, and someone who, would, who we had become closer to and had, uh, you know, as John said, adapted his book and like, what, what about David Koresh would make someone like David Thibodeau, a non-religious, you know, drummer that lived in Los Angeles, uh, what would make that guy move to Waco, Texas and start to follow David Koresh and what would make, you know, Steve Schneider or people that were, you know, very intelligent, um, uh, you know, not the type of people that would typically, uh, you know, follow a, a cult leader, uh, if you will, 
Um, but what would make those people follow David? And what was the reason to be there in their mind? And, and so I think we touch on that, but we didn't make it all about that because I think, um, again, we wanted to show it through the experience of people that would um, to buy into this belief system. Well, what's the answer to that? So why did they buy in? Uh, um, I mean, I've watched all 11 episodes and I, I have not read David's book, but I understand that David is still, uh, I think he still thinks that Koresh was a good guy. And uh, so how was he able to convince these folks to join him? Well, it's interesting. I think Thibodeau, you know, would say that, you know, I think he sees, kind, you know, mostly warts and all, but still may, you know, believe some aspects of, of uh, the events or, or at least had a like, hey, he said the armies of the world would converge on us. And then they did, um, you know, to us, like, you know, I, I think the power of belonging and the, the desire to belong to a community is really a powerful draw for people. And, you know, you see it, you know, from QAnon to, you know, something like Waco, you see this this power of unity or belonging to something that not everyone belongs to. Um, and I think that's a powerful thing to, you know, get caught up in. And it's a it's a really difficult thing, I think, for people to pull away from. and. So, you know, in season one, we wanted to show the predatory side of Koresh. We also wanted to see kind of how he was seen from the people there. They weren't there for, I don't know, to help his predation. They were there for a totally different, you know, uh, list of things, you know, from belonging to feeling feeling special, feeling like one of the chosen people in the world. Uh, I think those are really powerful things. Um, and I'd say, you know... It, as people get more and more isolated, I, I think those forces are even more, uh, you know, tempting to people. And I, I worry we're going to see more of this kind of thing. Giovanni, you play uh, a defense lawyer named Dan Cogdell, an actual person uh, who was one of the lawyers who defended one of the surviving members of the group. Uh, and you're a serious truth teller in this at times. I don't want to spoil some of the incredibly powerful scenes you have uh, in this move, movie. Do we call it a movie or a series? What do we call it? Series. Let's uh, call it a movie. Limited. Yeah, I guess. Uh, and so we have a clip of you strategizing with the defense team uh, and talking about how to try to sell a jury. And I think we should we'd take a look at this clip. Best okay. strategy is going to be to convince the jury that David Koresh was misunderstood. We need to humanize him, make him seem less like the boogeyman and more relatable. David Koresh was an opportunistic, narcissistic piece of shit. We're not in the business of defending Koresh. He's dead. <laughs> well, if that's how you feel, then why'd you even take this case? The issue can't be whether or not Koresh was the messiah. If that's our case, then they win. Because guess what? He wasn't. Our case has to be about the fact the United States government raided these people's home without cause, and it was their overreach, their hubris, that led to the deaths of 76 people, including 17 children. And in America, you don't get to do that. Because if they can do what they did to our clients and get away with it, it'll give everyone with a badge and a gun, from a whacking hot security guard to Janet Reno, the authority to do whatever they want, to whomever they want, however they want. And that's the argument we need to make. Amen. That was, I thought it was a really great scene uh, of you laying down the facts. Uh, I think we even bleeped you at some point there. Uh, oh, yeah. What were your thoughts, Giovanni, on Waco prior to being approached about this project? I don't know if you had, had opinions about it already. And did your views change as a result of being involved in this? Yeah, I mean, uh, I was saying earlier that my agent called me and said there's a they're they're making the sequel to Waco, and I said, oh, I I think you're mistaken. That's that's kind of like saying you're making a sequel to the Titanic because it was pretty definitive what happened. And I, he said, no, 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 you should read it. Um, and and I did. Uh, and you know, it was one of these things that that was so daunting and terrifying. I never thought that I would be involved in it. Well, at least my part of of the the second season is really kind of a, like a, a courtroom drama. Um, but I just I, I didn't picture myself 
as playing a, a criminal defense attorney. Um, uh, but then I, I couldn't stop talking about it and thinking about it. And finally, my my partner, my girlfriend said, uh, well, maybe you should do this. And so it was one of those things where I, was, I went to pick up the phone to say I maybe and then I just couldn't resist. And then, it, you know, I think it was just uh, for me, I, I was just lucky um, to to be approached and, and to and to work with the Dowdle brothers who um, is just one of those great special experiences that you just feel like uh, you're doing something that that might resonate. Do you agree with a lot of the things that your character said that that this defense lawyer said that this was government overreach and that this was uh, a horrible over prosecution of these folks? Well, I think that's one of the things that th that was, you know, really embedded in the writing where it wasn't necessarily taking on a specific point of view as much as it was just raising a, a topic of conversation or an argument make people think because i think that at the end of the day whether you're on one side or the other i think that it you, um it's something that we need to talk about that you know uh, waco and and ruby ridge before that uh were um you know, legitimate sparks for the american militia movement that we see uh nowadays which has been coined it's a term that's coined which is incredible and i, I think that as of 2011, there were uh, uh, 330 or 340 uh, known militias in this country, uh, which is, you know, essentially, uh, you know, uh, almost or virtually synonymous or could be with uh, um, homegrown terrorism. Um, and I think that 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 that's a sign of something. That's a sign of unrest and uh, and a sign of sort of dissatisfaction. So, yeah, to that extent, perhaps maybe looking at the notion of, of overreach would, would be helpful. Why, how did Waco become the beacon for this? These groups had existed before that, and any of you can take this, but where did, uh, how does this particular event remain so powerful? Why does it inspire them? Well, I think it was one of the first times, because I think Waco was before, I remember correctly, uh, before OJ. And it was one of the first times that it was uh, broadcast live on television, an event like this. So people were watching it in real time. And it was sort of surreal. And if, from what I remember, uh, 30 years ago, uh, it was surreal and and just sort of unbelievable. And it, it just uh, wasn't changing until things just uh, turned into this uh, catastrophic loss of so many lives uh, w with with children in there. I think there were 28 children in, in the buildings. Um, and, and, and I think uh, that, you know, the media coverage was probably a big deal. Um, um, and that's probably my only glib answer. <laughs> I don't know. You're right, by the way, that OJ was a year after uh, Waco. Right. Yeah. So you're right that this one was one of those you know, live cable news moments, you know, yeah. probably helped establish cable news as a place for people to turn for breaking news because the cameras would set up someplace and give you the constant updates. Uh, John mm -hmm. Eric, we saw in the intro video, uh, Michael Shannon's character, uh, Gary Nessner says, I feel this undercurrent of rage in America. Uh, can you, why don't you explain the events that followed the siege? That was what Waco, the aftermath, delves into. Yeah, so it, just to give a little backstory, so there, there after Ruby Ridge, a lot of the militia, existing militia groups around the country, got together and had a picnic and decided from now on we're gonna, you know, call ourselves patriots. We'll, we'll, you know, we won't call ourselves the Ku Klux Klan or, you know, things like that. We'll call ourselves patriots, and that became. Um, they started communicating with each other on a regular basis and they were waiting for kind of the next big event like Ruby Ridge to uh, get behind. And that uh, became Waco. So during the siege, a lot of militias were showing up. There was, there was threats of militias coming and storming and freeing the branch Davidians. And so the FBI really had a lot of, uh, a lot of concern about 
what was going on around, you know, outside of uh, Waco, Texas, uh, you know, while they were dealing with that situation. And then the aftermath of Waco, um, I think the FBI took a, a standpoint of like, no, nope, no, nope, everything we did was, you know, fine. Um, you know, we like, I think they were so uh, reluctant to admit fault that it fueled uh, fueled a lot of uh, these uh, groups' internal, you know, messaging and and stories of, you know, they sort of read it as this was intentional somehow. And I I I don't believe you know any of this was intentional. I think this was series of bad decisions. And, you know, Gary, um, you know, I, I think Gary would agree with that. We've got a question from the audience uh, and uh, I'll throw this over to whoever wants to take it. It's from Lawrence Lombard in Oregon who asks, did we learn anything? Well, I can take that, I guess. Um, you, I would say that you know, I think we've learned a lot. I think the FBI, uh, just looking through their lens, they did learn something. And, um, you know, if we look at the Montana Freeman standoff a couple years later, they were willing to wait forever. And they waited, you know, 88 days, far longer than Waco. Um, if they were to approach Waco again now, they would fence it off and they would wait forever until they ran out of water and ran out of food. They would never um, make the decision to go in with, with gas like they did. And so I think from a law enforcement perspective, um, we did learn something. I think us as a nation, um, you know, I think we're still reckoning with with the fallout from Waco. And, you know, back to your your question earlier, why this was the event. And, you know, my brother touched on it that, you know, these groups were kind of waiting for this an event of some kind um, after Ruby Ridge. And Waco came so soon after this kind of, you know, coalescing of all these disparate groups. Um, and then, as Giovanni said, it was on television for 51 days and everyone was asking ourselves, you know, how is this going to end? How is this going to end? And and then it ended the way it did in such a tragic and, and spectacular fashion. I think um, it was beyond the event that they were waiting for. It was the most, you know, incredible recruiting tool, I think, for, you know, that movement. Um, but I think we're still reckoning with the threat that, that this movement has, has spawned. And I think, uh, you know, in the last handful of years, I think we've started to look in the mirror a little bit more and look internally um, at the threat that coming from within this country. And um, it's something that I think we've really wanted to ignore for a long time, but are finally starting to um, pay attention to. Was Waco a case of religious freedom being violated by the government? Do you, I don't know if you guys took that angle or feel that way. And did your own religious backgrounds play a role in how you viewed that aspect of the case? I mean, a lot of people feel like these were just uh, devout religious folks who had established a compound in Texas and and weren't bothering anybody. Uh, that was, and so, uh, John and Drew, I, I saw you attended Catholic school. I don't know if you're still Catholics. Giovanni, I think you're a Scientologist. Does any of this resonate with you personally, or is it is it a different world from what you've experienced? Go, well, Giovanni. Well, yeah, I, I don't. Oh. I, yeah, I, 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 sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, like, you know, I, I feel like Drew and I. Yes, we went to Catholic school. It was also a military school, <laughs> so it was military and Catholic. And and I, I, the thing that really resonated with me was here is these, you know, these, you know, hundred people trapped in a building with the world staring at them, unable to speak. And the thing that resonated, like I, you know, I feel like you know, growing up in you know military Catholic school, like. I wasn't allowed much of a voice, you know, I wasn't allowed to, nobody really wanted to hear what I had to say about much of anything. And, uh, and, and that bothered me at the time. And, and to see all these silent people in the middle of this major event who nobody cared or, you know, they, they had no way of, you know, saying like, Hey, this is horrible. Like, you know, my, you know, kids can't sleep because they're playing psyops in the middle of the night or whatever. Like nobody, nobody was listening to them. And to me, that was the, the thing that really drew me in you know, more than the religion, more than like, like, Hey, they, they deserve a, 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 I don't know, a turn at the podium. Giovanni, you want to weigh in on that? Yeah. You know, I think it was really about, I mean, I don't think it had anything to do with religious freedom. I think it was about the, the, the arsenal that, that David Koresh and a few of the others were uh, collecting 
And this was the concern. This is why the the ATF and the the FBI showed up. Um, and uh, and so yeah, you know, for me, I, I think it really it 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 could have been any group, uh, religious or not, or uh, it was just it was about that. Um, and then obviously, uh, it, they became you know they came under the microscope over that the the course of of uh the media coverage true so much of the legacy of waco uh revolves around david koresh but the survivors are a large part of of waco the aftermath tell us about the survivors who were on trial and what happened to them yeah without giving away uh too much i would say right. it's a really it's an interesting story we've always found this uh we made you know the original waco as a limited series with no you know, uh, designed to continue it, but we always had in the back of our mind how interesting the trial was and how interesting it would be to continue. So we're really happy that we were able to do that. But um, the Davidians that were on trial, it's a really interesting um, combination of, you know, the the looking back to kind of take a deeper, uh, deeper look at their relationship with David Koresh and, uh, you know, their belief in him and how it all ended up, you know, working out in the end or not working out in the end, I think. Um, caused them to really have some second thoughts about, you know, committing their lives to him. And, um, but then at the same time, they lost so much. I mean, these people lost their family, their children, their, you know, all of the people they know. Um, so the relationship between, you know, such a grave loss for each one of these individuals, um, you know, can't be for nothing. Right. And I think that's, you know, a, a, an internal struggle that each of the, de the defendants um, was going through throughout the trial. And so 11 defendants went on trial, I think for purposes of simplicity, you cut that down to a trial of four. Uh, and, and those four initially were acquitted of the major charges, but the seven that you didn't show were convicted. Uh, and, uh, but they're now all out of prison. That's, is that right? Correct, correct. And mm -hmm. Giovanni, you as a lawyer in the, in the series, uh, you take a very powerful role in terms of uh, confronting your own clients about this. Mm -hmm. It's a, a cross-examination you do of them when they want to testify, uh, bringing up some of the bad stuff. I'm kind of interested to know what your preparation was in terms of who you consulted with. Now that you're, you're, playing, you're not creating a character, you're basing yourself on one. So did you talk to Dan Cogdell? Did you talk to David Thibodeau? Did you talk to Gary Nessner? How'd you, uh, how'd you do this? I, How do you I do spoke, it? Today? Um, I have no idea. I'm still <laughs> trying to. Uh, the uh, um, yeah. So uh, Dan Cogdale, the the uh, criminal defense attorney that I was portraying, was incredibly supportive of this project. The first conversation that I had with him was, "This is just not going to be what you expect," and I'm 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 not going to fulfill anything that you might want this to be, and yada yada. And he just didn't really care. He was just, uh, I, he was familiar with the material. He had read the 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 scripts and and was just so happy that this story was being told, because um, it was this this the the whole trial was was a, a, a passion of his and something that represented an ideology. Um, he was specifically uh, uh, defending. Clive Doyle, and uh, at first he was very much disinterested and, and had wanted nothing to do with it until he met with Clive Doyle in the hospital, um, who was still recovering from the siege, and uh, uh, Clive uh, was trying to communicate to him and, and was just uh, really sort of physically and emotionally shattered. He had he had uh, lost one of his daughters in in the fire and it was just it was just awful um and it was uh and so you know when you look at something like this i think as a criminal defense attorney one of the the reasons and i could be wrong about this but it was something that i could hook into was um was the idea of of uh, um fortifying or substantiating the ideology that everyone has the right to a defense 
in this country. And, you know, I don't, again, I, I, I think the, 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 the limited series, the second season that we did, doesn't uh, want to uh, necessarily take on a very strong political view. I mean, I, it does have a viewpoint, but it, it doesn't, it wants to just more or less pose the argument. My character was on the side of the argument that no matter what the crime is, you are um, uh, innocent until proven guilty. And, and as an American citizen, you have a right to, to a defense. And, and this was the thing that I think uh, is so specific to Dan Cogdell and most criminal defense attorneys. Um, and so it was an interesting thing because, yeah, I mean, he's he's had to defend, uh, you know, all the stories and the, the dinners that we had together. Um, he's had to defend some uh, pretty shady people that that were there. It's just patently clear. But at the end of the day, this is what our legal justice system is uh it, it, it's how it's made up um and so now i'm i'm just sort of up <laughs> talking i'm sorry i was like i hope that answers right. your question i mean you had a great line uh which was you said to the clients i don't think you're guilty of this charge but you're not innocent either and, right uh, that'll be my final That's spoiler for the show sorry guys uh we have yeah. another audience yeah. question that i wanted to slide in here quickly uh from howard weiss from virginia who asks what has been the most lasting impact of Waco on U.S. history. Uh, I would add that Donald Trump recently had a rally in Waco, and uh, John Eric, I'm wondering if you think that between Trump's followers and the January 6th insurrection and Waco, uh, what does that tell us about the United States in 2023? Yeah, I mean, I would say Waco, to some extent, uh was the breaking point where America suddenly started to have two histories being written at the same time. And mm -hmm. depending on mm -hmm. which side of a, an event you were on, you saw things from this you know, point of view or that point of view. And you know, throughout this, Drew and I have really tried to, you know, most of the books or you know, documentaries you see on Waco, you can tell very, very quickly, you know, they think this side was good and this side was evil. And very early on, we said, we don't want to do that. We don't want to, we want to see the human, you know, the, the human beings on both sides of a conflict and doing, an, you know, a thoughtful analysis of that conflict from a, from a human standpoint, not a, this side is right and this side is wrong. Um, and try to show, you know, problems on both of those sides and mistakes, not shy away from those. But uh, I'd say, I'd say Waco, you know, our, our history is really starting to separate at that point. Uh, Drew, throughout the show, we see Timothy McVeigh preparing for what we know would become the Oklahoma City bombing. I'm not sure he has a whole lot of lines in the show. He's, he's uh, moving around a lot. But do you plan on continuing the series to focus on his story? Um, it would be an interesting uh, continuation. There's no question about it. And uh, I think, um, you know, the aftermath of Oklahoma City uh, as it relates to his trial is a very interesting story. And so, you know, we'd love to. It's up to uh, the kind of folks at Showtime, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sort of piled on to Waco and, and became a, a rolling thing. And now April 19 is an important date in uh, in those folks' lives. Uh, I would also say that Timothy McVeigh and the world he was connected to, and I know, you know, it, it, from a prosecutor, prosecutorial standpoint, it makes a lot of sense to try him individually and to, you know, not look at conspiracy charges. But I think the world that he was embedded in and was part of is uh, worth exploring quite a bit more. And I think he, you know, played the role of folk, folk hero to a lot of people, which is um, extremely distressing. And I think that's a story that uh, deserves a lot more attention. And you did explore Elohim City and the, the white racist movement to some extent in the aftermath. Uh, and I could talk about that a lot more, but unfortunately that's all the time we have today. And so uh, Giovanni Rabisi, John Eric Dowdle, Drew Dowdle, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Good really appreciate you it. Thank you. And thanks to all of you for tuning in today. To check out what interviews we have coming up, head to WashingtonPostLive.com to find more. I'm Tom Jackman. Thank you for joining Washington Post Live.